Welcome back. Segment three. This is a great one. We've got State Representative Dan Ugosti is a state representative from the western suburbs, mainly St. Charles, Geneva, that area. And he is here to tell us what happened Tuesday in Springfield. Now, ostensibly, they were to go down there Mm -hmm. strictly to vote on a new map. Uh, Of course, the Democrats are calling this, oh, we're just tweaking the map that we passed in May. Uh, They were trying to make sure that they they used really bogus data. I'm sure Dan will tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And instead, they basically drew entirely new maps, which if they are taken to court and the judge decides fairly is unconstitutional. This should have gone to a bipartisan commission. Yeah. And you see the way some of those were drawn, like literally around neighborhood blocks there, the edges are all fringed. It's very, um, very diced up. Yes, it is. So here, here to talk about maps, the amendatory veto that failed on the ethics bill. And then that energy deal that passed the Senate, but the house said, we're out of here. Yeah. So, and then we've also got one more thing he wants to talk about, and it's a really important bill that he's the sponsor of. That's HB 843, which would take control back from the the governor because we've not we're now into 19 months of tyranny with this guy. So, Dan, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for taking time for us today. Let's start with the maps. Kind of tell us uh, where it was and why you were down there to remap um, anyway on Tuesday. Sure. Uh, In May, the Democrats came forward with a map, rushed the process um, to draw a map when the Census Bureau had yet to release final information as to the population in all the different districts. They took estimates based upon the community uh, data survey, as well as some other information, uh, the source of which they never shared with us or the public, and went ahead and drew some maps and passed them. Uh, strictly on a partisan vote, both in the House and Senate, and the governor signed it, despite the fact that he had previously promised never to sign a map drawn by political parties for partisan reasons. He wanted an independent commission to draw the maps, he said. He went back on his word, he signed the maps, so it was put into law, uh, maps back in, in, uh, that came out of the uh, General Assembly in May, I think the governor signed them in June, and basically became the maps for redistricting for the next 10 years where it draws the new lines for boundaries for the House of Representatives and state senators. So this was going to be the map going forward if something didn't happen. And of course, uh, we in the um, Republican Party had told them that these numbers won't be good. We need to wait. Don't rush the process. No one, uh, there are only Illinois was one of two states that rushed this process. 48 other states waited for the census data to come out. So the process was rushed. They drew the maps, and guess what? The maps were wrong. Census information came out in August, and it showed as much of a as a 30% variance between the largest house district they drew and the smallest house district mm-hmm. they drew. So constitutionally, just, they had to do something. They 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 couldn't. Those are those are uh, requirements in terms of drawing maps that you cannot overcome. There was going. They had to change these maps, and they still apparently drew them politically. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It was completely partisan, yeah. like the first time they drew them. And and I didn't mention this, but you're you're absolutely right. It, not a transparent process. They do it behind closed doors. The only people mm-hmm. involved are Democrats and the people they hire to help them. There's no community group input. There's no community group involvement. They hold hearings. They they hold public hearings. They set them and they hold them without providing people the map to even review. And they both, but they've all been done on a rush process. This last time, there were ten hearings. I want to say or nine hearings over five days but no one had a map to even review. And and the census data had just come out the week before. We are, I heard uh, someone interviewed from the uh, uh, representative from the Council of State Legislatures saying that we were the only state rushing this process. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the rush is this, as as you mentioned, the Mm -hmm. first maps wouldn't pass constitutional muster. Well, There is a clause in our Constitution, the Illinois State Constitution, that says if the map, if there's not an effective map in place by June 30th, the map drawing process has to go to an independent commission, which means four Democrats, four Republicans, 
have to sit down and agree on a map. And if they can't agree on a map within a certain amount of time, by some time, I believe it's in early October or late September, Mm -hmm. then what has to happen is it goes to a draw of a hat. Mm -hmm. And two names go in, and that person's going to get to decide how the map's going to be drawn. It's one Democrat and one Republican. So that's the process they're trying to avoid. That's why they rushed the maps in the first place and got them completely wrong. That's why lawsuits are still pending. And it's not just a lawsuit by Republicans in the Republican Party, but Maldefs filed a lawsuit as well, arguing that the original maps are unconstitutional and the current maps still are no good. Um, they, the, the current suit from Maldef doesn't um, contain that the, the current maps are no good. Those maps just came out and pleadings have not been amended right. if they're going right. to be. Mm-hmm. But we've heard calls from various community groups, and I believe Maldef was one of them as well, saying the current maps still are no good. They don't pass muster, and they shouldn't have been rushed in the first place. So, Well, what we do know is, like, I, I know that there's one particular uh, white liberal woman from the North Shore, and uh, essentially the, the legislation that they pass literally says that we are consolidating two historically black um, neighborhoods into her district for incumbent protection. And it really is, it's written that way in the legislation. I mean, there couldn't be more anything more political. And why is not the black uh, majorities down there? I mean, well, not major- the black caucus down there. Why are you not, not saying this is not fair? You are marginalizing what could be a black uh, district uh, and giving us more power. And you're putting it into a white, wealthy woman's, um, you know, North Shore district. Yeah. Why, <laughs> why, why anyone's doing what they're doing other than incumbent protection there that's and, that's and, right. and, and people right. trying to protect their seats? Yep. I, I have no idea. Yeah, um, they don't actually care it, about the minorities. Let's be clear. They don't actually care to represent Hispanics or the black communities. Well, they care about the incumbents that always serve their needs. And, and, and the, the political class is, the, is, is not changed one bit, it, whether Mike Maddox is in charge or it's Chris Welch. Well, actually, they are all the same. That's right. And the uh, Politico detailed the legal team representing the Democratic General Assembly. It's Mike Casper, who is uh, Mike Madigan's uh, lawyer, who's written a lot of the election laws. Mm -hmm. Heather Weir-Vaught, who was chief counsel to Madigan and represented his team when he was accused of ignoring sexual harassment claims. Adam Vaught, her husband, is also on the General Assembly's legal team. So it's, it's still Madigan's machine in charge of this process, is it not? Well, I, I wish I could tell you a lot of things had changed in Springfield mm-hmm. uh, with the new speaker, and we held out a lot of hope early mm-hmm. in the year because he said it would change. He, he guaranteed us things were going to change. We we're going to do things on a much more bipartisan basis. And look, I understand that there, there's a majority party and a minority party, but there's been nothing bipartisan yeah. about just about anything happening in Springfield this year and especially concerning the drawing of the maps. Well, there Nothing was, at all. There was some bipartisanship, apparently, around an ethics bill that passed, and it passed by large majorities. Both Republicans and Democrats voted for it. In many cases, it was a slight improvement from, from what we had in the past in terms of ethics. It did improve a little bit more disclosure. It, it ended a revolving door for where you could you know, uh, be a legislator one day and then the next day pick up a lobbying gig. Uh, it, it, but there were a lot of loopholes in it still. It wasn't sufficient given the level of corruption that we've seen in the last, just the last two years in the state, just the last two years, uh, with aldermen and, and, and state reps and uh, other elected officials and lobbyists indicted wholesale across the board. And, and all on the Democrat side, by the way, all on the Democrat side, mm-hmm. really. Uh, so uh, you, you have this thing, you, you put, you tweak a, an ethics bill and then uh, and then, you know, just an explosion of editorial boards saying this is insufficient. This is not right. This doesn't go far enough. I mean, that is what is being said. And um, and and then on top of it, the legislative inspector general, Carol what? Pope, quits. She's like, uh, I'm out of here. You've created a paper tiger here. This is not yeah. real ethics reform. So lo and behold, I think uh, Pritzker feels like he has to do something. So he does a technical amendatory veto, sends it back for another vote. And I'm told this is only the second time that an amendatory veto has died uh, in this way. So it killed the bill when not enough people approved the amendatory veto, then the bill was dead. So it's back to the drawing board. Am I summarizing that correctly? And what was the debate on the floor? 
So as, as you well know, I'm sure both of you know, ethics reform has been something the Republicans have been calling for for a long well, time. Yes. The, 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 the laws are far too weak on the legislature as well as the rest of the government as far as ethics are concerned. We've been asking for, for more. We have filed bills that would provide for stronger ethics um, laws within the state of Illinois, and we can't even get hearings on them. So mm-hmm. much like uh, in the past... Uh, General Assembly, the, the mm-hmm. prior one uh, from from the 101st, the 102nd took up legislation that was drafted by the Democrats and touted as ethics reform. And it does make a slight, as you mentioned, improvement. So it was it was supported because some improvements better than none at all. Mm-hmm. But even during the debate on that, we called for stronger ethics reform, stronger language, ask them to consider our language. Let's work on something together and put something together. The people of Illinois can then say we have trust in our government again because they have passed strong ethics legislation. And time after time, every time we make that argument, every time we present that debate, it's shot down. And that's what happened. So when this bill came back and we went down there for purposes of, re- of uh, voting on the maps again for a special session, we were gaveled back into a general session. Well, and they you, brought of course, up, of course. Do okay. you, as a state legislator as, and as a just a citizen and a taxpayer, do you get the feeling you're being played here? Because they write up something, give it a title, ethics reform, everybody wants it. It does nothing in the language, basically. It does effectively nothing to change anything. And so if you don't vote for it, you're going to take a hit at, Come campaign time. They're all. It's really easy to put on Miller. Dan Ugasi votes against a, a ethics reform, which everybody wants. How hor- like that's you know a shock to the system for your constituents. If you do vote well, for and, it, no no skin off their back because it doesn't change anything. So well, and, yeah, and you're that's screwed part one of way the, the other. Yeah, there, game. There's yeah. the problem. It, yeah, it yeah. is, and and of course, yes. this time we did vote against it because not only. Yeah. Not only did it not go far enough, mm-hmm. and we reach out to them and say, look, this you're considering an amendatory veto right now. Mm-hmm. We're not even in veto session. We have another month and a half, two months before we even go into veto session. Let's hold this. Let's work on real ethics reform, which not only the Republican Party called for, but the governor said yeah. would be appropriate. Oh, the governor's he's saying a liar. that this bill Nobody's... was wholly inadequate. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying he's leading on this. I'm saying that's what he said. But the yes. last so. people yes. on earth who should be dictating uh, ethics reform are Illinois Democrats. That's there. It's just. Uh, the, oh, but, it's just a joke. Look, but Kelly Burke is out there saying that she wants another by the apple, and if the legislature goes back into session in the next two weeks, that she will call for another vote. Uh, on the amendatory veto of the Senate Bill 539. And uh, so I don't know what she's thinking. I mean, this you need an act, uh, you need real overhaul. But I've always said also, look, you can write the strongest ethics legislation you want to, but if you don't elect ethical people, then you're going to you're going to have an ethics problem. Yeah. And that is the bottom line. Well, mm-hmm. that that may be true and and I'm not questioning your 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 uh, your, your statement. All I'm saying is one way or another, we need stronger ethics mm-hmm. laws in the state of Illinois. And That's true. I'm willing to do whatever we need to do to get those on the books because it will help. It, it'd be very helpful if we elected nothing but ethical people. You're right. Then we probably wouldn't even need stronger laws. But the fact of the matter is we don't have them. We do need them. And I'm willing to work and do what it takes to get us there. The reason we voted against it is because they didn't go far enough the first time. Mm-hmm. We weren't going to yeah. give them a way out the second time. We had even, uh, a Representative Bourne, I think, even stated she had written the governor a letter in advance of his veto suggesting an amendatory veto to even strengthen what he had in front of him, and he chose not to uh, go by what she was suggesting and took the weakest way out on his amendatory veto is my mm-hmm. understanding. I agree with you because laws do matter because when you find them um, with their other hand in the cookie jar, you need to prosecute them. And if you have to have a law to back that up. So you're absolutely right. 
uh, that we do need stronger ethics legislation. Listen, Dan, we're going to be there to make sure that you help out because your constituents cannot get bamboozled by some Democrat mailer saying that you voted against ethics reform. That's what they're going to try and do. Mm -hmm. We're warning you right now. If you're listening to this podcast, you have to understand that you cannot trust the mail pieces that come into your house. You need to check it out yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, okay, on to our next uh, two topics. The energy bill. This has been a huge deal. It's been a political football. You've got the environmentalists uh, pitted against the labor. And you think that the Senate came up with some sort of a deal. I, you know, apparently this came together so quickly that there wasn't even really staff analysis to even talk about to find out, uh, is Exelon still getting $700 million? Did they pair that back to $350 million? Do you know any details at this point? about what that Senate bill included or didn't include. What were the sticking points? And uh, do you expect to be back uh, fairly soon to do something? Because, uh, you know, Exelon right now is moth starting to mothball, apparently, at least two of their nuclear plants. Mm-hmm. So what, what I know about the details of the bill are sketchy. I know what I've been told by some other people who have uh, seen a little bit more of the detail. There is... Uh, some type of apparent subsidy uh, built into it for Exelon so that the nuclear power plants will stay open. Mm -hmm. I am also told, and and that was one of the big sticking points, uh, because there's not not just a lot of jobs with that, but Illinois then is allowed to keep its own production of clean energy. And there's, you know, that that's that should be looked at as a benefit to everybody. Mm-hmm. If we, we can keep some good jobs and we, we can produce our own cheap energy or uh, cheap and clean energy, it, it's better than having to import energy from other states. Um, mm-hmm. There's a, a provision regarding two coal fire plants for Prairie State, which is down in far southern Illinois, but is uh, municipally owned by many municipalities within the state of Illinois, including three of which are in my district. And when they bought into those plant, that plant, they anticipated it be open about 60 to 70 years. Well, that was just about 10, 12 years ago. And they're talking about shutting it down with a hard close date. Mm -hmm. Uh, The governor and the environmentalists of 2030 or 2035, it depends on what day of the week it is. I'm hearing the information. And this would provide for it to stay open, in uh, my understanding, until at least 2045. Um, There was talk about leaving it open indefinitely and making them hit uh, certain goals, but I guess, uh, uh, in reducing emissions, but I guess that was removed from the bill and they went with a hard close date instead of 2045. And the big issue there is these cities were buying into what they thought were the cleanest technology at the time for producing electricity with coal and you know we're being environmentally friendly and doing what they thought was the right thing and they bonded out for it for years to come mm-hmm. and those bonds won't be paid until the 2040s so you really if you shut this down you're really going to hurt not just these three municipalities but a number of them throughout the state down in southern children southern illinois as well that would not be able to uh, uh, uh you know obtain the benefit of power, uh, the power they paid for by uh, building this plant. So right. uh, it would be a huge, huge problem that way. So do you There's think There's a lot in there f- for solar and wind from Ugh. what I'm hearing and subsidies for those to make them profitable. Uh, don't know the extent of it. Again, waiting for the analysis. It was a 900 some page bill mm-hmm. that really just hit, hit the Senate and, and, and was, uh, was passed at early hours of the morning. And so, uh, so um, how can they how can they do that in fair? If, I mean, they they pass a nine hundred page bill in the in you know, in a couple hours. It's ridiculous. In well, all, and, and much much like we said for about the redistricting. I'm yes. sorry, Kathleen. Go no, ahead. you're good. In the back of the all of the back and forth on this bill, have you ever seen a strategy for getting to? full green energy, full renewables by 2020, 2035 or 2045 or whatever unrealistic date they've set? Is there any strategy in place from the Democrats or is it just we're a doing talking it? point? So, you know, the environmentalists put forth that there is one, but as far as I can tell from a practical standpoint, relying currently on uh, the the renewables we know about the solar and the wind 
in Illinois, it's going to require us to go out and buy electricity from outside Illinois if that's all we're doing. That's right. They're going to buy. If that's all we're yeah, doing. They're going to. They're building a, a massive transmission line to import wind from the the, the western states, uh, and they're going to say, well, they're going to give that a, a credit towards uh, Illinois produced. Um, uh, clean energy. It's not true. It's produced in other states and it's transmitted here. Uh, look, it, when it takes uh, 1,600 acres to produce 200 megawatts of power, it, it's not feasible. You literally can't do that. I mean, yeah, well, when, it's when, great when, when, I, I, so solar. One out. nuclear plant produces 1,100 megawatts of power. There's there's no way you can't make that up in territory. You can't make well, that and up Well, and I'm also told that they, they would have to turn to carbon plants probably uh, in other states and have yes, buy electricity from That's them as would. well. So what what are we doing? We're, we're mm-hmm. All we're doing then is effectively chasing more jobs out of Illinois so we can say we have the cleanest program available. It makes no sense at all. Well, Democrats no are good. Sense. Yeah, Democrats are good at doing that. They love to chase jobs away and people and, and everything else. And one other way that they're doing that is through the tyranny. We've got 19 months of tyranny with J.B. Pritzker. That means that he has been put in charge of like your entire livelihood. Right? Can, you have to wear a mask. Your kids can't go to school if they're they're uh, they, if they're in quarantine. Uh, you've got you know businesses having to come up with other rules again. I mean, this guy is uh, oh, oh you know you must have a vaccine. I mean, health tyranny. We're, we're talking talking full-blown tyranny by this guy it's almost as if covid only lives though within the borders of illinois because this is not happening in other states Mm -hmm. you have a solution you filed legislation that is extremely reasonable and in fact it doesn't even say that the entire legislator has legislative body has to get together and and tell pritzker no no it says that even the leaders can come together and say look we're a check on your power and your bill has gone nowhere but i heard you gave a very very good impassioned speech on the house floor about that bill you've got a number of co-sponsors could you just give us a little more information on this one Sure. Just quickly, this this really isn't even a, a litmus test on what the governor has or hasn't done. I, that's that's an argument or a discussion or a conversation we can have at another time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All I'm concerned about, really, uh, uh, bottom line, and, and it, I believe we do need to address what's going on at the present time. Yeah. But the my, the bigger issue to me is our system of government and protecting it, and what we have here is we have a system that was set up as a re- representative democracy in the state of Illinois and you know the the same within the country based upon a federal system mm-hmm. okay we're no longer operating that way one aspect of our lives in Illinois has been completely turned over to one individual to make all decisions for us for the last 18 or 19 months mm-hmm. and and this needs to end mm-hmm. because my constituents are contacting me saying, where's the legislature in this? Why isn't the legislature the one making these decisions? Because we can talk to you. We get to speak to mm-hmm. you. So my bill simply says this. We need an, an emergency management act. The governor needs to be able to declare an emergency in cases of an actual emergency mm-hmm. in order to take certain powers and make certain we can function as a state. That should be allowed for 30 days. The way I read the current statute, I thought that's what it said. It isn't exactly clear. I will admit that. But I thought it was pretty clear that that's all that was meant. The courts have ruled otherwise for the most part. So I brought forth a bill. Actually, I filed this bill last May, and I filed the new bill again, and I've been trying to get it presented ever since that time. Basically say after 30 days, if the governor believes that a an emergency uh, it continues and, and it exists and he needs to have these powers. He has to seek approval from the either the three or four of the legislative leaders in Springfield or the legislature itself. And if yep. for some reason, 40 members of the legislature don't believe that what's happening is appropriate, they can call on a, based on a petition, they can call the legislature back into special session and take a vote on the issue. To me, it's just, 
protecting our democracy. Yeah. That's right. And it, it, it would your bill would hold regardless of political party that's in charge of the legislature or the governorship. And it just makes sense to take that power back to the people. You're right. As a representative, you're much, much closer to the constituents and their needs, and you understand them more fully. So God I God bless you. We, we appreciate your work down there. Thank you for coming on our podcast. You've given our audience a lot of good information. Uh, and, and, uh, and honestly, they need to pay attention because everything that he just covered is a continuing issue in the state of Illinois. We will be back, I'm sure, with Dan and other state representatives to discuss this because uh, these issues are unfolding um, it will be unfolding in the next few months we will be looking at an energy bill I think in the next few months the maps will have an impact and be voted on and and legis- and uh, court orders made uh, decisions about in the next few months and they're going to impact what happens in this state long a long time into the future a long time mm-hmm. so thank you again Dan for coming on our podcast thanks for having me you bet